Dear ladies and gentlemen, Professor Matthew Gensko, fellow students and honorable guests. <coughs> I would like to welcome everybody tonight at the John von Neumann Award Ceremony and Lecture of Rye College for Advanced Studies. It is my pleasure to introduce you and welcome the recipient of the 2021 award, Professor Matthew Gensko from Stanford University. I would also like to... I would also like to introduce... <laughs> Professor Attila Chikan, President of the Rye College of Advanced Studies, Mr. Schold Füße, Director of Rye College for Advanced Studies, Mr. Artul Velkei, Chair of the Student Board, Mr. Adam Wig, Head Organizer of this event. My name is Lili Benedicta Nadeshi, and I will be the host this evening. First, I would like to call Artul Velkei to deliver his speech about the John von Neumann Award. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all, especially Professor Matthew Gensko, who is the newest recipient of the John von Neumann Award of Rye College for Advanced Studies. I am Arthur Welkei, I am the chair of the student board, and on behalf of the college, it is my pleasure to give this introduction before the lecture. And it's such a great pleasure that we can be here after such a short time once again. It was only last week that we gave away the Rudolf Andorka Medal for Social Sciences for the first time to Robert D. Putnam, and here we are again in the company of Professor Gensko to follow up with the John von Neumann Award. The John von Neumann Award is to be given to an outstanding scholar, a scholar whose work made a great contribution to social sciences and who had a substantial impact on our studies and intellectual activity. The John von Neumann Award, since its foundation, the college sets high professional standards for its students which demand us to look at the broader perspective and be well prepared in our scientific work. That's why we think it is important to value and learn from those scholars who extraordinarily shape the economic conversation about economics and social sciences. It connects us to the highest international standards available in the discipline. It is about the true academic excellence, formative work, and inspirational ideas. What distinguishes the John von Neumann Award from the other recognitions is that it is founded and solely given by students. We are the ones who nominate strongly inspiring scholars and who passionately debated the college assembly before electing the newest recipient. I believe that this proactivity, commitment and freedom are deeply valuable for our generation in Hungary. This is why the day of the award ceremony is an ex exceptional day for us. This evening, we give the 27th John von Neumann Award to an elected scholar. The award has been so far given to Janos Harsányi, Hal Varian, Janos Kornai, Jean Tirol, Oliver Williamson, Avinash Dixit, John Elster, Mori Opsfeld, Gary Becker, Glenn Lori, Matthew Rebin, Daron Asamoglu, Kevin Murphy, Philip Pagayon, Tim Besley, Joshua Engrist, Olivier Blanchet, Esther Duflo, Emmanuel Sales, Matthew O. Jackson, Alvin E. Roth, Richard Thaler, Danny Rodrik, Susan Aiti, Mariana Mazzucato, and in 2014, an honorary award was given to Kenneth Arrow. You may also recognize some of them as having received the Nobel Prize in Economics. Today, we give this year's John von Neumann Award to Professor Matthew Gensko, whose thoughts and work have strongly inspired our community. We are glad that so many of you came. Thank you. to introduce Professor Gensko's academic contributions and outline the reasons why the College Assembly decided to grant him the award. Welcome and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Radan Vig, and on behalf of the organizers of this event, I have the honor of presenting Professor Matthew Gensko, the 2021 John von Neumann Awardee. Matthew Gensko is a Lando Professor of Technology and the Economy at Stanford University. He received his Bachelor, Master's and PhD degree from Harvard University. In the past decades, 
This path-breaking work has answered a set of interesting questions related to the field of media economics. His work has shown that media reporting is systematically biased and that competition allows for more of the viewpoints to get out. Thanks to him, we also know that media influences its audience on their decision in political participation and sometimes in how they vote as well. Members of Rye College were immensely inspired by his methodological contributions to the quantitative analysis of textual data, which helps us measuring polarization and partisan newspaper slant. Reading Professor Gansko's paper, we've been impressed by the variety of topics he has done research on, ranging from persuasion, polarization, health, and media economics. In one of his works, he studied the role of internet and social media in the increase in polarization experienced in recent decades. Another demonstrates that by controlling information that is made available, systematic persuasion is possible, even if you are all rational. In one of his recent pioneering works, he contributes to our understanding on the use of social media. Digital technologies occupy a large and growing share of leisure time, and Professor Gensko showed that heavy formation and self-control problems play a substantial role in that. This diversity pre is present in the different approaches he considers depending on the problem at hand. Some of his papers use quasi-experimental evidence to identify a causal effect. Others contain significant contributions to economic theory. Some papers deal with small data sets, others rely on frontier big data techniques. Professor Gensko's work not only inspires us in asking interesting questions related to a broad range of important social issues, but shows the way in finding appropriate data and methods answering those questions. As students, I think this is the kind of inspiration we are looking for when we, when we elected Professor Gensko last year. Dear Professor Gensko, we are honored that you have accepted our award and our, win and our invitation. We really hope that your stay at the college helps us to get to know you and your ideas better. Please accept the John von Neumann Award of 2021. Thank you very much. Professor Gansko to give his lecture. Okay, well thank you. Um, thank you so much, dear colleagues. And thanks to all the students, especially all of the students on the committee. Um, and thanks to everybody for coming. This is a huge honor and a wonderful thing to be here in Budapest, first time that I've ever been here. Um, it, it, it makes me really happy to get to be here. I think it's just also the whole structure of this thing where you all, students, choose this award, um, actually read my papers, I guess, uh, <laughs> think about these things, it just it makes it really, really meaningful. I, I think I, my students at Stanford who I love very much. I don't think uh, always read my papers with <laughs> quite as much care and attention, even when they're assigned required reading for classes. Uh, so it means a lot that you guys would do that. Um, and of course, I mean, you read out that list of people who have received this award. These, you know, these are my teachers and mentors and heroes, and so it uh, is a real, real honor. So I thought um, today. I would talk a little bit about polarization um, and also the relationship of polarization to social media. This is going to draw on some pieces of work that I've done, some facts um, from other people's work too. I, I think it's what I want to talk about today is going to really be focused on the situation in the US, um, which has its own peculiar characteristics. I think this situation with polarization and social media and related issues in Hungary is different, but I think that there are also uh, themes here and lessons from the data that um, apply pretty broadly, and so hopefully 
both we can try to understand a little bit better what's going on in the U.S. and also draw some broader lessons. Um, and I think that you know the broad idea is going to be to just put some facts on the table. Um, there's not going to be any theory here. There's not going to be any kind of grand conclusions. I, one of the things that I have thought in looking at this, the public discussion that surrounds this issue, as well as the public discussion that surrounds a lot of issues related to this in politics and today, is there's, there's a lot of talk with relatively little evidence and a lot of things that people kind of accept and believe as accepted wisdom that we all know what's going on when actually we don't know what's going on. So, I, you know, with, with a lot of different colleagues who have contributed to this, I think we found it helpful just to try to do the very simple thing of bringing a few facts to the table to kind of ground the discussion. It doesn't answer the questions, but at least it, like, takes us a little step closer. Um, so th I, I think it is, it is hard to overstate, if you're sitting in the United States today, how huge and pervasive and deep this issue of polarization is right now. And, and it's changed fast. I mean, it's, it, as I'll show you, it's part of a very long-term trend that's been going on, you know, since I was born, more or less. But it's changed really fast in recent years, and there's just a, a, a kind of sick, frightening feeling to politics in the U.S., to political discussions in the U.S., to kind of our sense of ourselves as a nation, our sense of ourselves as a democracy. It's a really, really difficult time. Um, and so two simple questions, really, to talk about. The first might sound like a question that's not even worth asking because the answer is so obvious, but um, first question is, is it true that polarization in the U.S is higher than it's ever been, that it's rising. That's something that, though it might sound obvious, has been the subject, at least until recently, of a lot of discussion and debate, particularly as it applies to polarization of citizens. So there's this kind of like separate literatures in political science on polarization of politicians, or like the politicians in the legislature more divided than they've been before. But particularly with regard to polarization of citizens, there is a lot of debate, has been a lot of debate. Um, and then second, what role does social media play in that? And again, I'm not going to answer that question. I wish I knew kind of in, in full terms the answer to that question, but I'll kind of show you some facts that I think maybe are informative or at least help us get a little bit closer. Okay? Um, so, so let me start with is there a rise in polarization in the U.S., and let me start with voters, citizens. We'll talk a little bit about the politicians, too. Um, and so, you know, just to flag, as recently as 10, 15 years ago, th there was actually kind of a consensus in political science that the perception that many people had already at that time, that political polarization was growing and widening and deepening in the U.S., the consensus among scholars was that that's kind of a myth, and that if you look at the data, that you don't really see evidence of that. I'm going to show you I don't think that that's true today, and you could think of two ways that that might not be true today. One is they were right then, and things have changed, and another way is they were not quite right even then, and I think both of those things are, are going to be true. Um, and, and so what I, I think is we now have a clearer understanding of is it really depends how you define polarization and how you measure it and what that means. And it's one of these things, like many things, that if you think about it carefully, it can mean a lot of different things and there might be a lot of different ways to conceptualize it. And so what is actually true about the data in the U.S. is that there are some ways of defining and measuring polarization under which it, it wasn't going up then, and it actually still hasn't gone up that much today. And there are other ways in which it's very clearly been rising. And figuring out which is which is actually pretty important, because there's a lot of nuance to what, what, what exactly is happening and what isn't happening. Okay. So here are a few places that you might have thought to look for evidence of polarization 
and where a lot of that prior literature was kind of focused on looking for evidence of polarization. So what, what might you think to look at? One is look at how people describe themselves. Do people say that they're liberal or conservative? Do they say that they're left wing or right wing? And what polarization might mean is that more and more people self-identify in the kind of extreme categories. So it used to be that a lot of people would say they were moderate or slightly left or slightly right, and more and more people identify as very left, very right, extreme left, extreme right. That's one thing that might be going on that, as I'll show you, is not going on. A second, which is, which is kind of a, a, a close cousin of the same thing, is maybe people's party identifications are becoming more polarized. So it used to be that many people had, in the US, where we have two parties, sort of loose affiliations with the parties, and they might vote Democratic some of the time and Republican some of the time. And more and more people have kind of very solid, strong identities with the parties in terms of what they report. That also turns out not to be so true. And third, another way to define polarization is based on people's views on issues. So if we think this is sort of dear to political scientists' heart or to economists' hearts, so because in a lot of models of elections, the way we sort of study these things, often think about the, the kind of fundamental driver of political outcomes and policy is going to be what is the distribution of views in the electorate. What is it that, what policies do people want? That's going to determine how they vote. That's going to determine what policies get enacted. So another thing that could be happening is that on individual issues, it used to be that, say, on tax rates or abortion or different questions, people used to have moderate issues, mo moderate issue views, views on those issues, and now those have spread. So, um, you know, quickly just to show you on each of these, um, so I don't know if you can read that, but that is a plot going back to um, the early 1970s of the distribution of people's self-described political ideology in the U.S. So the, the kind of natural categories in, in the U.S. when that question is asked range from very conservative, conservative, moderate, liberal, very liberal. Um, this plot only goes up to 2015, I apologize for that, but it, the picture looks similar uh, if you project it out to today. And so what you see is that that's just been very stable over time. The actually large share of Americans self-identify as moderate, and then a large share identify as kind of leaning conservative or liberal. Very few identify in these kind of very categories, and that's been pretty stable. So if you were looking at the data, you might say, gosh, polarization is kind of a myth. We don't really see evidence of it in the data. Um, this is the same thing with party ID, it's party identification. So here, the, you know, you're asked a question, would you say that you're a Republican or a Democrat? And then if you say, or neither, if you say, I'm not really either, you say, well, do you lean? So you're kind of independent, but would you say you lean more toward one party or the other? And then if on the second question, you still say, no, I don't lean toward either party, then you get classified as independent. So that creates these kind of five categories. And here again, you can see it's been quite stable over time. And if anything, the trend over time has been toward more people identifying as independent of the parties, not more people being kind of strongly identified with the parties. Um, okay, so that's another place you might look and say, oh, that doesn't look like polarization. Um, I'm not gonna show you lots and lots of issue view questions, um, but this is an example of what many political scientists in that earlier literature were looking at and pointing to when they said polarization seems to be a myth. This is an example of survey questions that have been asked over a long period of time on Americans' views on abortion. Should abortion, questions like, should abortion be legal? And there are a few different answers you can give to that question, ranging from, I think abortion should be illegal always, to, I think it should be legal always, or I think it should be legal under some circumstances, but not others, like gestation of the um, fetus or the circumstances of the pregnancy. And so, you, you know, what, is, what you see in the U.S. is actually a large majority, or at least the, the large plurality of voters have what you might describe as kind of moderate intermediate views. Fewer people have these extreme views, and that's also been pretty stable over time, um, and that remains pretty true today. So you might look at all that stuff and say, gosh, Polarization is not rising in the U.S. Um, and some people did look at, at those data and conclude that. So, 
is, is it right that we're all just, this perception we all have that our country is kind of coming apart at the seams wrong? Or is there some place in the data we can look to see this? And if so, where do we look to see it? And I think, I think there are two main, there's a longer list of things I could put up here. There, there's some subtler other things that we could look at where you can also see evidence of polarization. But I think these two are kind of the most important. One is sort of simple and one is a little bit subtle. So the simple one, which I actually think is also the most important one, is forget about what party people identify with. Forget about policy views. What do people think tax rates should be or abortion policy or immigration policy? Forget about all of that and just ask people, how do you feel about somebody who's a member of a different party? If you're a Democrat, how do you feel about Republicans these days? Do you feel positively toward them, warmly toward them, or do you feel negatively toward them, coldly toward them? That's a very different thing, right? It's not about extreme views on policy. It's about some, something quite different. It's something that in literature is called affective polarization. Um, and uh, Shanto Iyengar, who's a political scientist at Stanford, and a number of others kind of pioneered this idea of looking at those kind of measures as a different way to capture polarization. And then the other, which is the subtle one, is I told you that people's, what parties people identify with, the kind of distribution of that hasn't changed so much. And also that if you look at a lot of individual issues, you see views haven't changed that much. But what has happened in the US actually to a quite dramatic degree is all of those things have become more correlated with each other. That is, people are more sorted so that their party lines up with their view on issue number one, which also lines up with their view on issue number two, which also lines up with their view on issue number three. So if you go back 50 years in the US, it was much more common to have somebody who was, say, identified as a Democrat, but had very conservative views on some social issues, but fairly liberal views on some economic policy or other different configurations of that, you can imagine. And there's a whole interesting history to why this sorting has happened. Um, and also why, I mean, the US is kind of a, there's a peculiar history of why the US ended up with party coalitions, which were quite kind of awkward and not well sorted to begin with. It relates to the history of the South, where the Democratic Party in the South was the party of whites in the South and conservative whites in the South going all the way back to the Civil War when the Democratic Party was in the South and the, Re the Republican Party was the party of the North that they were fighting with. Whereas in much of the rest of the country, the, the, the Democrat became the party of the left, the Republicans the party of the right. So you had these things kind of scrambled up for historical reasons and in recent years they've kind of unscrambled themselves. And so these things line up much more with each other. Um, and I think these two things, you can see them going together because think about how you might feel from, uh, if I say, how do you feel about Republicans these days? How you feel might be pretty different if Republicans are people who are different from you and disagree with you on everything, as opposed to they're, they're a heterogeneous bunch. Some of them agree with you on some things. Some of them disagree with you on others. Um, so a few ways to see this in the data. So one is just, instead of taking one by one, hopefully that's big enough, you can read it. Um, instead of taking like one by one individual issues, suppose I build an index of a bunch of different issues, take each issue and line it up from a left wing position to a right wing position, and then sort of average all those together to get an index of how left or right is your position. Um, this comes from surveys, not, this is not from my work. Um, so what would you see if you have this kind of sorting? It's if people have these kind of scrambled views, a lot of people are going to have an average view, which is kind of toward the middle. And as it becomes more sorted, more and more people, as that correlation gets high, more and more people are going to end up with across the board conservative views. That puts you on the right of the scale. Across the board liberal views, that puts you on the left of the scale. So you can see here's 1994 when the distribution of views in the US is like very, single peaked in the middle. There's actually like most Americans have the, the modal thing in, in the US is to have this kind of moderate views. And you can see changed a little by 2004, not much. And then this huge change up to 2017, which is the last time we have this kind of survey data, that distribution just spreads out quite 
dramatically. Um, here's a different way to look at it to see the correlation with party. So same thing, same index of your views, but now let me plot it separately for Democrats and Republicans in the US. And you can see in 1994, as you would expect, Republicans being the party on the right, Republicans have on average more conservative policy views, Democrats on average more liberal policy views, but uh, you know, there's a lot of overlap and they're not that distinct. And you see again, a little bit of change by 2004, but a huge change between 2004 and, and 2017, where the parties have really spread apart in terms of the average views of their voters. Um, here's one more way to see, this is, this is a little bit different, but it's kind of picking up something with a similar flavor. This is approval ratings of the president over time. So each of these like different vertical stripes is a different presidency. So this is, this goes up to the beginning of the Trump presidency. We don't have Biden here, but Trump, Obama, George W. Bush, US presidents going back in time. The blue line is on average at a point in time, how much do Democrats approve of how that president is doing? And the red line is how much do Republicans approve of how that president is doing? So two things stand out here. The first is these things kind of flip back and forth, right? That makes sense because people tend to approve much more of presidents who are part of their own party. So the red line is top on top whenever the president is a Republican and the blue line is on top whenever the president is a Democrat. But another thing you can see really quite dramatically is that gap between those has really widened um, and gotten much, much bigger. And, and another thing is maybe a little subtler, you can see this picture, it used to be that those things kind of co-varied with each other a lot. So things would happen and both the Democrats and the Republicans approval would go down and then something would happen and both the Democrats and the approval Republicans' approval would go up. So people are kind of responding in similar ways, even if they have slightly different averages. We don't really have that anymore. Under Obama, and if we extended this out, you would see this for the whole Trump presidency. There's just like no response to anything. Approval rates are just these like locked in um, kind of constant things. Okay. So that's one set of places where I think we see this clearly. Here's the other which is this idea of how do people feel and effective polarization. So first of all, just a couple of, um, I think of like a lot of different ways you might measure this. These are just a couple that I really like from Shanto's work and others' work um, pointing out. So one thing you could ask people is describe people of each party on various traits. Like how smart would you say Democrats are? How smart would you say Republicans are? How selfish would you say they are? How you know, kind, giving, I don't know, different things you could ask. So it so happens that, that we have this kind of comparable question asked in 1960, all the way back in 1960, and again in 2008. And blue here is, on average, what do people say about people in their own party? And red is, on average, what do people say about the opposite party? And so in 1960, there is a gap in the direction you would expect. So people said like, yeah, our people in our party are a little bit smarter than people in the other party. Yeah, not by much. And definitely the people in the other party are somewhat more selfish than we are, but not by much. You see in 2008, those gaps just get enormous. So people's perception of the traits of these other parties has diverged dramatically. Here's another thing from those same surveys, kind of, famously vivid way to capture polarization in this kind of effective domain is ask people, how would you feel if your son or daughter or child married somebody of the other party? It's like, is that fine? Would you be upset? And this is asked, you know, for context, this is not asked in isolation, it's asked like in a long list of things. Like, how would you feel if your child married somebody from a different country? How would you feel if your child marries someone of a different race? How would you feel if your child marries someone of a different religion? And so on. Um, in 1960, people m m you know, expressed potential displeasure on a number of those other dimensions, but nobody, people were sort of like, what do you, like, of course not, I don't mind, I don't care what party the person that my child marries is. Very few people said they would be upset in 1960. 
by 2008, um, a substantial 20, 30 percent. And I think when this question is asked today, we don't have like a perfectly comparable version of it, but when it's asked today, it's solidly up in the 30s, 40s percent of people are saying, like, yeah, I would be upset. And today, that's way higher than for anything else. So you have to be a little bit careful because there's some social desirability bias. There might be people who, you know, maybe they would have strong views about the race of the person that their child marries, and it's not really okay to say that on a survey, so they're not saying it. So take it with a grain of salt. But for what it's worth on the surveys, this is like way bigger than country, religion, race, anything else that people are asked about. Okay, now the, the more fine-grained way that we can measure this, which is um, now going to show you this, getting some stuff from our own work, but that, that the literature has used a lot, is there's a question which is asked um, in the U.S. on surveys going back quite a ways, which is called a thermometer question. And so the question is, on a scale of 0 to 100, how warmly or coldly do you feel about people in the following group? And again, that group we, we might ask about people of different religions or countries or things. Here we're asking about parties. And so the question is like, on a scale of 0 to 100, where 100 is warm and 0 is cold, how do you feel on this thermometer about Republicans, about Democrats? Um, and so we can plot that here, breaking out how everybody feels about the people in their own party, so what you said about Democrats if you're a Democrat, what you said about Republicans if you're a Republican, and how people feel about the opposite party, how you feel about Republicans if you're a Democrat or vice versa. Um, so the top is how you feel about your own party, the bottom is how you feel about the other party. Obviously, people feel better, more warmly, toward people in their own party, but the gap between those things has diverged um, steadily over time, and you can see a real, um, you know, it's, it's like pretty steady, but 2020, um, it's like the widest that it's ever been. Um, okay, and so this, I'm not gonna tell you everything that goes into this, but basically, I want to show it to you because I'm, we're going to use it a little bit later to look at some other things. Um, this is an index that combines this gap with a number of other measures of the things we've been talking about, like this correlation difference and so on. Um, and we combine all those things into an index and then look at how they've changed over time. And what you see is those measures have very clearly been going up. Now, it's not so cool that I can show you they're going up because I picked the measures that are going up to put in this index. So that's not like a kind of revolutionary finding. But I think what I want you to think about is if we now focus attention on these things where we do see these increasing trends, what do the patterns of those trends look like over time? And in particular, if we're going to start thinking forward to like ah, how much of this might have to do with the internet or social media or other things, you know, what, what do those time path look like, and I, I think important things to note are, one, this has been going up for quite a while. It was going up before the internet. It was going up quite a lot before social media became a thing. But there's also clearly some pattern of acceleration here, which could be related to those things. So we can think about that some more um, as we go along. Um, really quickly on, on what's happening in Congress, so we're going to be focused, I want to keep attention mostly on like people, voters. There is this kind of parallel literature on what's happening in Congress. And just to show you what that looks like, um, so this is a kind of classic plot from the political science literature of polarization among legislators, the two houses of the U.S. legislature called the House and the Senate, so this is like the lower house, the upper house of the U.S. legislature. This is a measure of how polarized those legislators are as measured by their actual votes on bills. So roughly speaking, this thing is going to be low if there's lots of crisscrossing votes. And so the, there's some bills where, you know, we all vote together. There are other bills where different coalitions vote together. There's a lot of shifting alliances, then this is going to be low. If instead, if you have something like what characterizes U.S. Congress today, where almost every bill that comes up, all the Democrats vote one way, all the Democrats vote the other way, then this thing gets really high. So what you can see here is, again, a very clear pattern of 
increasing. Um, again, if we extended it out, it I think would keep increasing. This measure is also neat because we can go back further in time. I couldn't show you effective polarization for 1880 because we don't have survey data on effective polarization from 1880, but this we actually have records of roll call vote. So you can see that um, it has been going up a lot, but it's also the case that there have been previous periods in the US that were pretty polarized. And that, you know, is important to remember. We had a civil war where we were like shooting each other. That's pretty intense polarization. There have been deep, deep divisions in the US in the past around race, civil rights, other issues. Um, but in the current period, it is absolutely correct in Congress that as measured by how people vote, um, these differences go up. Now, to quickly show you, I'm not gonna have time to kind of explain all the machinery that goes into this, but um, this comes from some work that we did. So, so this, like roll call votes are really interesting, but they're also kind of a little bit of a, a, a funny measure because they're very strategic. How you vote in the legislature is a very strategic thing, is not always the same thing as what do you personally think is the right position on an issue. Um, and we thought a very different way to look at this would be what about if we, if we instead look at the speech, the actual things that Congress people say, how do those differ? And that was motivated by the observation that these days there's a ton of very kind of coded partisan language or partisan rhetoric which is designed to be kind of persuasive where Republicans and Democrats, when they talk about the same thing, they use very different language to describe it. So when, when Republicans talk about cutting taxes, they call that tax relief. Relief sounds like you're being relieved of some terrible thing that you would like to get rid of, like being taxed. That's a good way to describe it if you're trying to cut the taxes. Democrats tend to call those things tax breaks. Like, we're giving people tax breaks. That sounds like you're giving them a break from, you know, that, that I don't know if that translates, but ta break in that context has a, a kind of connotation of you're letting people get out of something that they really shouldn't get out of, right? So we, have, we see a lot of that kind of language. So our question in this paper was, can we take the text of the congressional record? That's another thing that we have going way back in time. So we not only have the roll call votes, but we have the transcripts of everything that people said in Congress going all the way back. We go back to 1873 here. To some extent, these things go back even further. And can we look and see, is this partisan language kind of a new phenomenon? So the way we're gonna do that without going into the detail is take all that text, teach a computer using some kind of standard fairly standard machine learning algorithms to try to guess what party somebody is from based on what they're saying. So like the computer's job is, here's somebody, they say something, we didn't tell you whether they're a Democrat or a Republican, you have to guess, you the computer. I'm gonna train the model to try to do that. And then the question is how well could the model, how well could a computer tell what party you're from based on what words you use? If all the Republicans say tax relief, and all the Democrats say tax breaks, that's gonna be pretty diagnostic of your party. And the machine learning algorithm will pick that up and say, all right, if we hear that word, we know that they're a Republican. If we hear that word, we know they're a Democrat. So an index of how well we can predict your party based on what you say is gonna be a measure of how differently are you speaking. Um, this is what that looks like in the US. Forget about the gray line here. That's like a little bit of a, quality check on what we're doing to make sure that thing is flat, which it should be. That's just like, what if we randomly re-scramble everybody's party labels? But the pink line here is our measure of how polarized is language. Um, remember that a roll call vote thing has this kind of U-shape. This thing is like slightly increasing, but very, very flat all the way up until about 1990, and then it just like has taken off vertically since then. Um, so I don't have time today to talk about all of the, the kind of interesting story behind what happened in 1990. That was like, where this starts going up was a very famous election in the US where um, Republicans took over control of Congress and did so in a way that was like very explicitly built on choosing this kind of language and deploying it strategically and so on. What is true is this phenomenon of the two parties in the US really speak different languages is a genuinely new phenomenon, something that did not happen in our history before and is really dramatically true today and continues 
to be dramatically true um, in even more recent years. So this is just to get a sense of like how big is that change. So I told you you could think of this as guessing somebody's party based on their speech. Now, our little algorithm is going to be better able to guess your party the longer you talk for. Right? That makes sense. So once we fit this model, we can, for any amount of speech, we can say um, how well you could guess somebody's party. So this blue line just shows you, suppose that somebody talks for a minute as a benchmark. So as recently as 1980, if you heard somebody talk for a minute, our super sophisticated fancy computer algorithm that's digested all of the text, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of text, is like a little bit better than chance, like 55% chance of guessing your party. By the like, peak of that series I showed you by the uh, late 2000s, it's like 70%, 75%. Um, so that's a pretty huge change. Now we're guessing really well. Okay. So that's polarization. Next question is, does that have anything to do with social media? And again, I've kind of told you the answer to that in some sense, because a bunch of what I just showed you is stuff that happened before social media. Um, so we're going to need to kind of zoom in and think harder about the most recent years and some of these series and what's happening. Obviously, this is all motivated by the fact that the hypothesis that the rise of social media is the key driver, or at least one of the key drivers of the polarization we're seeing, is a really live hypothesis in this debate. And there are a lot of people who, you know, from, from the president, I mean, from President Obama um, on down, a lot of people have, have really stood behind that hypothesis as, as likely a key cause. Um, so what can we say about that based on the data? We're not going to answer the question. We can maybe at least, like, get a flavor. So step one, um, I think it is useful, again, you say, like, a lot of these discussions, people talk and talk and talk and there's no data. And one of the things that happens when you talk and talk and talk and there's no data is you lose track a little bit of the sizes of things. And things that are new and things that are different often seem bigger than they really are, and things that are old and boring, like people watching television, seem kind of smaller than they really are. So a good thing to keep track of is just how important is social media overall in people's news and information diets? So I don't know if you can read this, but this is like two different surveys, one in 2016, one in 2020, that asked people basically what was the most important source of news for you about the election? And so in 2016, you see the options here, whoops, sorry, the options here are different kinds of TV, cable TV, network TV, that's like the national broadcast networks, local TV, a website, which would be also like a news app or something like that, print, radio, and then social media. So in 2016, about 14% of people said that their most important source of news was social media. And by 2020, that had increased to about 16%. Um, percent. Okay? So that's big. 16% of people having social media be their main source of news about the election is a big deal. We should be worried about that. We should be concerned about that. But that's very far from, like, we are now a society that gets its news from social media. It's a minority of people, a pretty small minority of people who really have social media as the main way that they get news. As we'll talk about, there's obviously an age gradient to this, so it differs a lot what cohort you're talking about. But it remains true that television is the most important source of political news in the US. And so that's important just for context. Doesn't answer our question, but it helps kind of fix the size of things. Um, OK, so then two, two bits of research um, from our work. And these are two papers, each of which you know, are kind of like little fact papers, just like the, one fact that might help us get a handle on this. Most of what economists do when they do empirical work, those of you who read a bunch of these papers have noticed, but many of you might know, 
is focus a lot on causal inference. Like how could we, in this case, really nail the causal impact of social media on stuff? And we'll talk about studies that have that. These are not that. These are just like descriptive evidence, any facts that might be useful. So here in this first one, the fact that we thought might be useful is, can we break down these trends in polarization across different demographic groups? and see which groups are getting polarized the most and which groups are getting polarized less. Why might that be interesting if you're thinking about social media and so on? Is because there is in particular one key demographic difference that's really related to how much people use social media and as we just said, that's age. And so, you know, until very recently, um, people over 50, over 60, over 70, use social media very little. That's changed just a little bit in the last few years, but, you know, and young people use it much more. So if social media is the main driver of increasing polarization, you might, it doesn't have to be true, but you might think we would see particularly big increases in polarization among young people who are the ones using it, and not so much increases among old people, older people who are the ones not using it over this period. So it seems like that might be diagnostic. Um, so we can look at that. This is just the thing that you all know is true, which is how much people use social media. So this is like a, a survey question. Um, do you use social media at all? Like, do you, have, do you have any social media accounts even? So you can see it grows from the introduction of Facebook in around 2004, so that by 2012, basically everybody under 40, um, you know, 80% or so of people under 40 have social media accounts. And until pretty recently, the share among people 65 and older, 75 and older, it was quite small who have social media accounts. Um, and that's a bit higher today, but it's not, not that much higher. Well, what about polarization? Well, here are trends in polarization by age. So this is that same index of nine measures that I showed you before. So we take that index of those nine measures, the correlations, the feelings, all that stuff, and now we break it out separately by different dem demographic groups. And, you know, what you see, which I think is striking, is if anything, so one, polarization is going up among everybody, and two, if anything, it's the oldest people whose polarization is going up the most. So we think that argues against, to some extent, the hypothesis that social media is the main driver of what we see. Now, everybody here, could like spend 10 minutes thinking about clever ways that maybe this could be true, even though social media is the main driver. That's like a good homework exercise. Um, and we acknowledge and recognize it could be that the older people are talking to the younger people. It could be that what's on social media gets on television and then the older people see it on television. It's like a lot of different channels and spillovers. Um, so all of that is possible. It doesn't settle a question, but we think it's kind of diagnostic and at least a useful fact. So, Here's the second thing that seems like a useful fact. How do these trends that we're talking about differ across countries? So another thing that's true about digital media, social media, is it's used and grown pretty much everywhere in the world. So in, again, in the kind of simplest possible story, if the internet, social media are the key driver of rising polarization, we might expect to see that polarization is rising broadly across, say, Western democracies or countries where social media has become big. Um, I'm not, by the way, as I'm just, since we're ticking through a lot of different things, I am not reading off the names of my awesome co-authors and collaborators in each case here, but you should recognize their contribution to all of this is uh, enormous. And so you can, you can go back later and see who all of them are. Um, okay, so, so what can we do to look at this across countries? And, and you might ask, like, didn't we know this already? Surely we've looked at polarization trends in lots of countries. The, the reason that it's a little bit hard is that we don't have, there's not like a harmonized data source that goes back very far in time that lets you measure polarization in a comparable way in lots of different countries. So what we did here was focus on this effective polarization measure I showed you, which is the like thermometer for your own party compared to the thermometer for the other party. And that turns out to be something that we can go 
kind of look carefully and find election studies in lots of different countries. Again, these are my collaborators doing some like hard labor, sweat, tears, toil, collecting those individual surveys, harmonizing them, getting them back over many different years to try to build this effective polarization measure for a sample of, we were able to get up to like 12 different countries. So to, to just make sure everybody's clear on what that is, so this is what I showed you before, right? So this is like how you feel about your own party on the top, how you feel about the other party on the bottom. The measure of polarization is gonna be the gap between those two things, right? How different are those two things? So this is that gap, this is just literally the difference. If you take the difference of those two lines, um, it looks like this. And um, plotting here like a regression line to show how it's sloping on average. So consistent with what I just showed you, that gap has been going up a bunch in the US, um, has gone up from like a gap of 27 percentage points up to about 50 percentage points, and I think we'll see in the next figure in more recent years has gone up even further out to like 50, 55 percentage points. So question, what do you think that plot looks like for Canada, for the UK, for Germany? I don't have Hungary, I'm afraid. Uh, I wish if anybody here is an expert on Hungarian national election studies, we can't go back to 1980, I guess, um, at least in a comparable way. But um, what do you think that would look like for all those other countries? Would we see that it's going up everywhere? Would we see that it's very different? Um, that might be interesting for a variety of reasons, including it tells us something about the role of social media, or at least the internet. Okay, so here's the answer. Some of these, again, are a little bit small on the screen, so let me just read them out to you. So I've sorted these countries in order of how steep the slope is. So in the upper left is the US, you see the slope of that line. That's the rise in effective polarization um, for the US. Actually, I realized I put in, this was the one before we extended it out to 2020, but you can see that one is extended out to 2020. See that big blip up in 2020? So like the US in the 2020 election um, got even way more effectively polarized than it had been before. And then these are other countries sorted by the slope of that line. So of the 12 countries we look at, the United States has the steepest increase in effective polarization. Some other countries also have increases. Switzerland is next. Switzerland is a little tricky because we don't have that many data points, so it's a little sparse. See, so if you removed that one data point way at the left, it would look pretty different. But Switzerland, it looks like there's an increasing trend. Third on the upper right is France, which has been increasing, but at a, at a slower rate. Denmark, Canada, New Zealand, increasing but pretty flat. And here are the other six. So that's Japan, Australia, the UK, Norway, Sweden, and Germany. So is effective polarization going up everywhere, at least in this sample of 12 countries? No. The US stands out very dramatically for being quite different from these other countries. There's some other countries where it's increasing, there's some countries where it's flat, there's some countries where it's decreasing. So that also feels important to this question. Now, let me, let me flag a couple things about this evidence. So one, even though for, for some of these things we're able to go up to 2020, you know, we don't have that many data points post-2010. So if you're concerned about social media specifically, this is not the most diagnostic thing. Like, we, we have limited power to tell you, you know, are things kind of turning up in the last few years. Um, I think for the internet, if, you, if your hypothesis was like starting in the late 90s, there's a trend because of the internet broadly, then this speaks to that pretty strongly. But I wanna give a little caveat to how much you could infer from this about social media. It is true that there are some upticks in recent years. You see that in the US, you see that a little bit in France. Um, if you look at the UK, for example, which is top right here, you know, everybody's like, surely polarization has been going up in the UK, they had Brexit, people are upset. Um, and there is a, a positive trend post 2000, but overall, over the longer term, that trend has been pretty flat. Now, here's the other key thing I, th I think to think about for this is like, 
you might have thought, hold on a second, you showed me how you do this in the US where you have only two parties, but what about all these countries that have like many different parties? How do we measure polarization there? And that's really important and there's not a simple answer and it's subtle and it's kind of back to the answer depends a little bit on how you measure it and how to decide to do it. So let me tell you what we're doing here, first of all, which is what, what we want to capture, what we think is the closest analog to the, uh, to the effective polarization measure in the US is, on average, take, take each person in the country and measure how do they feel on average about everybody who's not in their party. And then kind of average that up across everybody. So that means that, for example, if you had a country that has two big, like a big center left party and a big center right party, and then a bunch of little parties, it's gonna mostly be driven by how people in the center left party feel about people in the center right party and vice versa. And we actually could, we could do, make all these plots if you just focus on the top two parties in each country and that looks similar. Now, here's something that's not gonna show up as a big increase here, is suppose you have a country like Germany where you have two big parties, they account for most of the voters, they're doing whatever they're doing, turns out what they're doing is kind of moving toward the center and actually becoming less distinct and people are less upset at each other. But you then have, say, a new populist party far on the right that starts out really small but starts getting bigger. And everybody hates the people in that little party and the people in that little party hate everybody else. That could feel in the society like a really big and important kind of new form of polarization. We have rise of extremist parties, rise of where there's like a lot of tension. That's not gonna show up here because it's, it's a small share of people. So if you're living in Germany, you don't have the experience of like a large share of the people in my country, I feel really negatively toward them, but you might still have the experience of there are some people who I feel really negatively towards. And that could be very important and is not captured here and could be something that is facilitated by the internet and social media that this wouldn't be picking up. That makes sense? Okay. Um, so, from just that evidence, what would we conclude? It is clear that polarization, at least as we measure it, follows different trends in different countries. That is less consistent, although not definitive, with things like the internet, which have, roughly speaking, changed everywhere. And it's actually less consistent with a pretty long list of other things that have also trended similarly in the countries that I showed you. So one of them is inequality. Inequality has been rising in the US, is something that we think of as an important potential driver of polarization. Inequality has also risen in almost all of the countries I showed you here, and which countries it's been rising in is not very related to where polarization is rising. Um, trade, immigration, and so on. I don't have a complete story for you. We could talk more um, about what is driving this in the US, but I think there are some US-specific things that are, um, at least part of the story. There was a particularly important change in cable TV markets in the US where we went from having basically only very centrist television news that was what everybody was watching to having like quite partisan extreme cable networks. There's also this whole story I mentioned about the history of shifting party coalitions and how the parties became more sorted. Um, so all of those are, are kind of US specific things. Donald Trump, Barack Obama, those presidencies were distinctive and important in different ways and were very US specific. Um, but I think, I think we can at least get a flavor from that. Okay, last thing I wanna talk about and then maybe we have some time for questions. Um, the, 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 the final kind of piece of this that we've been working on gets back to how might we measure the causal impact more directly. So all that's kind of descriptive evidence. And also how might we get a, a sharper look at like what's happening today or in 2020 or more recently. So one of the things that's really neat about studying this question is we now have the ability, the technology, the possibility of doing randomized experiments at pretty large scale to try to get at these questions. So let me talk about a couple of those. Um, one is, uh, paper that was published in 2020. It was focusing on data from, the, from basically 2018 in the US. Um, and 
the structure of this experiment is pretty simple. We res recruited about 3,000 US users of Facebook. There's a whole backstory to how exactly this happened, but roughly speaking, we got everybody to agree if we paid them an amount, which was like $100, they would be willing to deactivate their Facebook account for a month. Then among those who were willing, we randomized them into two groups. Control group doesn't change anything. Treatment group, we pay them to turn off their Facebook account for a month. We can check whether they did that, because if you deactivate your Facebook account, I can tell that your Facebook account is deactivated just by going to your Facebook page and getting an error message. Um, so we do that for four weeks, and then at the end we ask, we try to measure as many outcomes as we can. Um, one of the things we were really interested in was political polarization and also related political things like news knowledge. There's also a whole separate set of questions about uh, the impact of social media related to things like mental health and happiness and well-being. And so this kind of had the flavor of if we're going to all the trouble to like set this thing up and pay people to quit Facebook, we'd better try to measure as many different things as we can. So there's a whole separate part of that paper about those outcomes, which I'm not going to, uh, we could talk about at the Q&A if you're curious, but I'm not going to talk about here. We focus on the political ones. So this happened in 2018. We timed it to coincide with the an election that happened in the US in 2018. So this is not the presidential election, but it's like the off-year legislative election. That happened in, in November, like November 4th, I think, of that year. Um, so we recruit people in September. They're randomized in October. It's October to November, basically the month before the election that they're off of Facebook. And then we have an endline survey where we measure most of the outcomes and a little bit of evidence post endline survey. We recruited people on Facebook with ads. That turns out to be a good place to find Facebook users if you're looking for them. Um, you had to be a US resident, 18 years and older, and we restricted attention to here to people who say that they use Facebook at least 15 minutes a day. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. We weren't so interested in studying what is the impact of Facebook on people who don't use Facebook. So we wanted to focus on that um, heavier group. This is just saying you can deactivate your account easily. We can check it. So results from this experiment. First thing, before we get to the polarization things, I think if you start thinking about what might be your theories for the way Facebook impacts the world, a pretty important thing for that is what are people not doing instead? Or equivalently, if I turn off your Facebook account, what are you then going to go and do? So for example, if, if all the time you were spending on Facebook, you're now going to go spend reading really high quality news sources and really thinking hard about politics, that might have one effect. If you're going to go just like waste time watching silly videos on YouTube, that might have a different effect. If you're going to go have really meaningful conversations with your friends and family and spend a lot of time in like face-to-face -face social interactions, that would have a different effect. So it's pretty important which way that goes. So the first set of measures here answers that question. What happens? The average person in this experiment, before the experiment, is using Facebook about an hour a day. So if you get randomized in the treatment group, we hand you back 60 minutes. What happens to those 60 minutes? So the way to read these plots is um, these are the effect of turning off Facebook on each of these outcomes in the rows. So the red line would be zero. Anything to the left of the red line means it went down. Anything to the right of the red line means it went up. The little things that make them look like Saturn moons or TIE fighters or something are 95% confidence intervals. So if that doesn't overlap the red line, it means it's sig significant statistically. Um, so here, what goes down? Non-Facebook social media time and non-social online time both go down not up. What does that mean? Means did people substitute that time toward other digital things? No, not only that, they actually used other digital things less in this experiment. So it seems kind of surprising. You might have thought people would substitute. One way to think about it is if you're not on Facebook, you're not like taking your phone out of your pocket every five minutes and when you take out your phone, you then flip over to you know, Messenger or something and, and do other things. So, total digital time goes down, that means people get back not 60, but more than 60 minutes that all goes to offline, non-digital stuff, and that kind of increases across the board. So we had, these can be broken down more finely, you can see in the paper, but people spend more time watching TV alone. Is that good or bad? Uh, hard to tell. They spend more time doing other things alone, like reading books, and they spend more time with their friends and family, which you might think, under, particularly for these mental health, happiness, loneliness, 
kind of outcomes, pretty important. Um, okay. Quickly on these last things, news knowledge, we measured a bunch of different ways, a bunch of different versions of how knowledgeable are people about facts. So this is another big debate about Facebook. Is it like misinforming people? It's a bunch of fake news, people are learning incorrect things, or is it informing people and they're actually getting real information from it? Here, when people are off of Facebook, they know less. They're less able to answer quiz questions about the news. They're less engaged with politics, they say. Um, we measured whether they're more likely to agree with a bunch of like fake news, misinformation things that were circulating on Facebook at that time, and the answer is no, up to what we can detect. So it looks like actually, if you pull people off of Facebook, they know less, i.e. Facebook itself is making people more informed. Finally, Facebook itself is also making people more polarized. So these are a bunch of different measures of polarization. They kind of bounce around. The bottom is just an index of all of those measures. On average, they're all falling. So when people are off of Facebook by a bunch of these different measures, they're less polarized. To our kind of key question, so although I showed you a bunch of time series evidence, a bunch of these other kinds of facts that I think argue against the view that Facebook is the most important driver of polarization, we do measure a clear significant impact of Facebook on polarization. And so it does contribute to this problem even if it's not um, a central driver. So from this experiment, Facebook makes people more informed. It also makes people more polarized to a you know, small, maybe modest degree, but significantly. Um, it also, by the way, makes them less happy. So 30-day Facebook detox made people feel happier, less anxious, less lonely, um, and so on. Let me just, I'm not going to talk about the details of this. I just had a couple of slides on it. We're in the middle of getting ready to release a bunch of papers involving experiments that we did in the run-up to the 2020 election, including one that's kind of like a larger scale replication of what I just showed you, as well as a number of things where we were able to work with Facebook to randomize different characteristics of people's news feeds. Like, did they see political ads or not? There's a treatment where we, there's, instead of the, the, what you see being algorithmically curated, we just turn off the algorithm entirely and people see just chronologically everything that their friends are posting. We can downweight like-minded information. We can downweight misinformation. So we'll have a picture of, um, I think a richer picture of what's going on, but I'm not allowed to tell you the results yet. So I'm not gonna do that. They're not quite public, but soon, hopefully in the next few months, um, hopefully they'll be published and therefore able to be shared uh, by the fall. Okay, so I'll skip over that. Coming soon, <laughs> results. So, uh, to conclude, this thing is real. I think, I think there was some debate about that in the past. There's not really debate about that anymore. I don't think you need me to tell you that if you live in the U.S., um, but you can see it in the data, and importantly, to see it, you need to look at the data in, that right, in the right way, and that tells us something about what is really going on here. It's not about who's a Democrat or Republican. It's not about who says they're conservative or liberal. It's not really about individual issue views. It is a lot about how people feel. And I think that's really important. Although I can't say for sure, I think broadly the facts look to me like anything involving the internet, digital media, social media, is not the main cause of this broad long-term trend that we have in the US, which has been going on for quite a while. Um, and similarly, in other countries, but that doesn't mean that Facebook, social media don't contribute to polarization, and when we really zoom in, we can see that they do to a significant degree. Maybe small, it's maybe a small part of it, but it's significant and real. Okay, I'll stop there, thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Professor, for your outstanding lecture.
Uh, hereby, I encourage the audience to put questions to Professor Gensko. We would like to allow as many questions as possible, so please note that the ideal question would be one sentence with a question mark at the end. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to come be the moderator for all of our seminars at Stanford, you would be <laughs> welcome to do that. Thank you for uh, the lecture, Professor. It was uh, awesome. My, uh, my question would be that uh, the data you presented looks at the US as a whole. Do you have any states level evidence? And the question would be that uh, what looks like polarization as on the level of the whole of the US, doesn't it look like more unity than ever in like local communities, states? Thanks. Great. Yeah, excellent question. So, um, I, I, think the, I think the answer, roughly speaking, is yes. So, the, the, the U.S. patterns of political alignment are extremely correlated with geography. So, you've all seen those red-blue maps of U.S. presidential elections, maybe, or some of you have. Um, the, there, is, there is a lot of geographic correlation in where people live, and a lot of people live in places where their experience is not, I feel really negatively toward half of the people around me because most of the people around me are from the same side of the political spectrum as me. I live in a place like that. Like, I, I literally, I, I think this is right, I do not know one person who works at Stanford University or I've met anywhere near I, where I live who voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> I won. Um, there are a couple of people at Stanford who I infer may have voted for Donald Trump, I'm not sure, but <laughs> nobody, nobody who, who, uh, who I know for sure. So it's, it's very sorted geographically. Um, and so I think it's, it's right that, that some of this is like some parts of the country pulling apart. There's also been a sorting. We said like issues are sorting to each other and people are sorting to parties. That's also happened geographically, so the strength of that has gotten bigger. It's not really, by the way, so much across states as it is the really dominant thing is like urban areas relative to outside of cities. So if you look at the map, you look at the red-blue map, it looks like if you do a color, color the U.S. by states, it looks like a bunch of states. But if you look, if you kind of look at it more finely, it looks like a bunch of blue islands in a big red ocean. That's kind of how it looks. Great question, thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, I believe there was someone in the fifth row, but maybe you will be next. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, you mentioned at some point that uh, indeed many countries have a multi-party system rather than a two-party system. And I was wondering whether you think the fact that the United States has this two-party system, whether that contributes to the polarization. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it absolutely does. And, um, it, you know, it, again, really nailing that down and showing it to you firmly with evidence is tricky. I don't have, I don't kind of have the counterfactual, here's what the U.S. would have looked like as a multi-party system. But it, it is, again, I, it's, it's like so important here and, and a lot of, there's been a lot of really good evidence on this that just in the U.S. now, everything is lined up with party. Those two parties, it's, it's correlated with your race, it's correlated with your education, it's correlated with your gender, it's correlated with your views on issues, it's correlated with where you live, it's correlated with your values, it's correlated with your religion, it's like across the board. And, and that, it's not at all obvious why that would happen, and I think that, that there are strong kind of forces pulling for that to happen in a two-party system. Plus, the other thing is, you might have noticed that like the Republican Party in the US has moved in a direction that at least many people who would have been traditional Republican voters you might think would not be super excited about. That was originally like the pro-business party, say. It was originally, uh, there are a lot of reasons to think that that they've kind of veered into a different part of the space. The Democratic Party in the US has also moved in a direction that in a traditional kind of left-right spectrum you might think of as moving pretty far left. 
a lot of people might ask, like, doesn't that open up like a huge space in the middle where somebody else could um, come along and say, hey, all of you centrist voters who are kind of disillusioned from both of these parties, let's create a new party in the middle and do something, a little bit like happened in France. You could do that in France, you can't do that in the US. It's like very deeply structural in the way the US political system is set up, that it's incredibly hard for a third party um, to be successful. Great question. Uh, thank you. Just a second. There was someone uh, here in the, yes, if you will be next, and then uh, the other gentleman. Okay. Yes. Uh, here. Sorry. Uh, yes. Oh, thank you. So my question would be that uh, you showed that uh, the people who are getting the polarized most are those who use social media uh, less old people. But uh, have you studied, or others have studied, whether social media use has a bigger or a, a different effect on these old age groups? Because you can kill, clearly see that uh, there's a significant increase, although it remains quite uh, small. Excellent. You did your homework. That was good. That's, yeah. High on that list of other things that could be going on is, yeah, maybe the impact on older people is bigger. And there actually is support from that, so support for that. Um, definitely, if you look at patterns of social media use by age, they are quite different. And they're kind of different in the direction you'd expect, which is 75-year-olds on social media look less digitally literate and sophisticated. Um, there's an amazing study looking at the sharing of fake news, misinformation, you know, these really kind of wacky conspiracy theory kind of stories during the 2016 election. And an unbelievable share of those stories are shared by people over 65. It's actually, they account for a small share of the user base, but actually they accounted. Something that's true, so you have to be a little bit careful with this, because other things that are true about sharing of misinformation in 2016 is it's actually a lot smaller than people think. Far fewer people were exposed to that than people think. And it's very skewed overall. So the, the sharing and exposure of that such as it was was confined to a small number of people who shared a ton of it saw a ton of it. But those small number of people, a disproportionate share of them were, were older people. So absolutely, and I think that's possible. I don't think that it quite gets us out of the, the challenge of those figures because particularly prior to 2020, the, the share of older people using social media is just so small that you would need those effects to be so big um, in order to generate, to be kind of like the main driver of the polarization we see. But I think, I think it's for sure could, could attenuate and kind of moderate the picture there. Thank you. The next person will be the gentleman there in the middle. Yes. And then the lady. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your lecture. So I wanted to ask a pretty similar question, so I will rephrase it a little bit. So how do you think that uh, the different social media platforms affect polarization. So my hypothesis would be that some are, are contributing to it highly and some others maybe less and this can also have a connection with age groups since different age groups use different social media applications. So what would be your insights on yeah, that topic? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. And so, and this is something that also obviously has changed over time a lot too. So what is the portfolio of you know, which social media are most important has really changed. Over, going back in time, Facebook was overwhelmingly the most important thing for all age groups. If you go back to 2018, 2016, before. Um, but that's changed a lot today. So, so, so I, I, I would say a couple of things. I mean, one, we don't know for sure. The 2020 study, when I can share it with you, we have both Facebook and Instagram. So we can look at those separately and distinctly. Um, one piece of the answer to that question is just how big are different things in different age groups? And there are things, like I was saying about kind of getting what's big and what's small straight, that's like really important. There are things like Twitter, which are super important in some ways. Like Twitter is incredibly important for elite discourse. Like if you're a journalist, Twitter plays a really important role in what you know, what you say, how you get information. If you're politician, if you're an academic, for any academics, 
but it's a tiny share of people who use Twitter very much. And so it's not very important as a direct conduit. It might affect people because what's said on Twitter then gets reported in the news and so on, but it's not a directly impacting people. Other things that are, you know, the things that, the other things that are big are basically Instagram, chat apps of various kinds, so WhatsApp in the US, Snapchat, things that are like WeChat in China. So bilateral chat apps, but that also end up being used um, a lot for politics. And then things like TikTok, or TikTok in particular now, which is a kind of yet another uh, very different kind of thing. So I think Instagram and TikTok so far do not have a large share of political content. There is political content, it matters. I think they're relatively small in their role in politics still, although that could change. Chat apps like WhatsApp, particularly in outside of the US, like WhatsApp in Brazil is the overwhelmingly dominant political means of communication. Those I don't know, and they're super hard to study because they're encrypted. And so you can't see the content in, in the same way. Um, and then, the, and then the final thing, I guess, that is also really important is just YouTube, which is not, sometimes people call it social media. I don't think you would call, I don't think it's quite right to call YouTube social media, at least it's very different, but just, it, it, particularly for younger people, YouTube's kind of replaced television a little bit as that kind of passive consumption source and is hugely important and way understudied. We have like way, 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 way fewer studies of YouTube than we have of other things. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, there's a lady in the fourth row. Uh, yeah. Can you please uh, keep your hand up? Yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you for the lecture. It was depressing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm curious specifically when it comes to globalization and the proliferation of social media, has your team seen any specific indicators of what I'm going to call spillover from, for example, um, Bolsonaro and Trump or Trump to Boris Johnson and the type of language that is used originating in one country, but like forming some organic alignment with the political discourse in another? Good, good question. So yeah, let me one, apologies for being depressing. I think you know, there is, there is some, some that is positive here, I think, I think in the sense that the, some of the narrative about what's happening, I think is not right. I think the fact that this is less of a worldwide global phenomenon than we might have thought, I think is positive, but it is kind of, I think the reality, you know, that picture I showed at the beginning, it is, it is a tough, um, difficult time. So spillovers is really interesting. So we, so, we did, tried a little bit, and I think some other people have tried a little bit to look at like that specific stuff that happened in the 90s in the US that like caused that line to go way up. Can you see that kind of strategic language diffusing across countries? And I think there is, like in Canada, for example, there's evidence that um, what happened in the US was it was like an innovation by the Republicans in this like 1994 election when the Republicans took over the House under Newt Gingrich, if anybody knows who that is, they had this like very elaborate messaging strategy, choosing these kind of phrases. It really worked, so then the Democrats started doing the same thing. There's evidence that like in Canada, they were borrowing that. Now, Trump, Bolsonaro, Brexit, and other uh, leaders around the world who are imitating similar kinds of populist uh, rhetoric and policies that diffusion is an incredibly interesting and important question. You know, what's clear is this is a kind of wave that swept the world in a way that doesn't seem like just chance. Um, and so, so what are the channels by which that's diffused? How much is there kind of structural things happening in all of these different countries that create fertile ground and then therefore it's happening? How much is direct imitation and learning and copying? Um, I, I don't know, I don't have those data. I don't, I don't think we really have a great handle on it empirically, but I think it's super important and I agree with you that looking at just kind of language um, could be a really neat way to do that. Like COVID, you saw a ton of this. You saw like kind of framing and rhetoric that showed up in the US, also showed up in Brazil, also show, showed up in other places. 
So I think it would be a neat thing to study. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, yeah, you go first. So um, my question will be related to age as well. I, if I understand correctly, there is a consensus that as people get older, they also have a higher engagement in votes. And if uh, isn't it the case that it seems that younger people are less polarized just because they do not care as much about politics? So the main driving force if, is if you care about politics or not. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So we know how. Like three things go very closely together in general, and it relates to the experiment too. Um, how engaged with politics are you? How informed are you? And how polarized are you? And just kind of in the cross section, those things very clearly tend to move together. If, you, if you're not paying much attention to politics, you also don't know much what's happening, and you're also not really mad at anybody about it, because you don't know what's going on. The more you know, the more you're engaged, the more you also tend to be polarized, and all of those things tend to move with age, so people who are older, partly just a kind of time on your hands effect maybe. Um, people tend to be more engaged with politics and more polarized. I think, it, you know, and I think that does, that does account for some kind of level, level differences in those plots. And really what I want you to take from that is not so much the fact that it's gone up more among the older people, but just it's gone up among everybody and it's definitely gone up among the older people who are not using social media. That's the kind of key fact. Why has it actually gone up less among younger people? Some of that could be starting from a lower base. Some of it could be other factors. Thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman in glasses in the back. I think he should be next. Thank you for the presentation. On one of the slides, you showed two pie charts comparing where people get their sources of uh, information from um, I think political news, 2016 and 2020 elections. And what I've noticed is that the biggest increase is not in social media, but in news websites or apps. And if we consider that social media mostly uh, amplifies the messages that come from those parts or from the TV parts, why is the debate so much focused on social media and not on legacy media companies and media companies in general? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I, I think, I mean, my overall view of this is we should be focusing on social media maybe a bit less and legacy media more. Certainly if we're trying to understand what's happening now or what's happened in the past. There's a separate kind of interesting question about like, what do we think is gonna happen in five years? Um, but I, I think for sure, like TV is really important in this and it's also right that those legacy media companies are really important. And it is for sure true, what you said is exactly right, that if you look at what gets traction on social media, we, we all imagine this kind of virality process, right? There's like a lot of thought about like viral stuff spreading through social networks. And so the way that like some crazy misinformation thing spreads is somebody posted and somebody else shares it and then it like picks up fire and it kind of grows organically. That's quite rare in terms of the network dynamics on social media. Most things that get big get big because they get a big boost because they're on a mainstream news site or some other, you know, in some other context like Kim Kardashian posts something about it. and so. It gets really big. So that's how things get big on social media. Legacy media is super important. I, I, think, I think basically the role of institutions like Fox News and CNN and MSNBC and these like big news outlets in the US is just incredibly um, important. They, they, they are different in some really interesting ways. I mean, we've, we've studied, a thing I didn't have time to talk about today is kind of the echo chamber phenomenon and this, this idea that people end up in digital media just kind of consuming news and information that's very much like-minded from their own side. The idea that people are stuck in echo chambers is quite true on Facebook and is emphatically not true if you look at consumption of news websites and apps outside of social media. So there's a big difference. News websites and apps outside of social media look a lot more like the way people consume television, the way people consume traditional media, which definitely has some partisan correlation. Right? People on the right and left look at different things, but there's much more overlap, much more mixing than people tend to assume. So there's a whole literature 
that's basically documented. The echo chambers phenomenon is way overstated, except on Facebook. And so a way to say it is, when we looked at data a little while back, suppose I kind of plot for you how echo chambery are different things. And you can look at traditional media, and you could look at like old fashioned kind of news websites and news apps, and those are all pretty small. Suppose I look at something else, which is not media, but how echo chambery are the people you actually know and talk to and interact with face to face. That has always been like off the charts, way more segregated. So people have always been much more likely to be on the same website or TV show or newspaper or radio or whatever as somebody who has an opposite view than they are to encounter such a person in their family or their workplace or their neighborhood or so on. And basically, if you then look at Facebook, Facebook looks like right here. So consumption on Facebook looks just like people's actual social networks, which then, if you think about it, might not be that surprising. So if we knew that people's social networks are way more segregated than anything else, the idea of, here's a good idea, let's filter everybody's news consumption through those social networks, it's going to be bound to, to produce that kind of effect. Thank you. And uh, the next one will be the gentleman here in the front. Here in the first row. Yeah, thank you. Please keep your hands high when you. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I'm interested in the mechanism of of these media effects, uh, let it be social media or, or mainstream media on polariz polarization. And my question would be, what is the most important channel of causation from, from your point of view? Uh, is it cognition, uh, echo chambers, or, or emotions these, uh, these contents, online contents evoke? Or, or uh, is it something uh, doing with engagement, so behavior aspect. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a super interesting question, and I don't have I don't have a great answer in, in that I could tell you exactly the role of these different pieces. But a couple thoughts. So one, I think for for human beings, emotion and cognition are kind of the same thing. There's like a lot of evidence that the part of our cognition, which is like frontal cortex conscious processing of thoughts, is a pretty small share, not only of what determines our behavior, how we move around a little, but actually how we reason and think about things. So like emotions are a huge part about of how we form beliefs, how we form intuitions about things. There are these amazing studies, you guys all know these studies, but like you look at people whose, whose brains are damaged in ways that, roughly speaking, prevent them from feeling emotion. So there's like particular brain lesions you can have that basically shut down centers of the brain that are associated with emotion. And these people have the experience in life of kind of moving around with, with a very deadened kind of affect. They don't feel happy about things. They don't feel angry. They don't, all of those things are kind of really shut down. The, the fascinating thing is that those people also find it completely impossible to make any decisions or to reason about things. You might think like this would be, it would be sort of like Dr. Spock, like your emotions are shut down, now you don't have this, like, this thing that is messing up your reasoning, now you can just be this like cold, cool, calculating reason. And that's not how our brains work. Like we use emotion as a way to reason about the world as a way to, to make judgments, as a way to make decisions. That's a huge part of how we process. Our brains process like way more information than the little bit that we can process consciously. And so anyway, I think it is like the, the people's engagement with political content and all of these things has a huge emotional component. That's part and parcel of their like trying to form beliefs and so on. So I think that mechanism is really important. The, the other thing I would say which it's not exactly a mechanism, but it's, it's a piece of the mechanism which is really important, is trust. And like, one, one version of this you could have is that like, people process, people receive lots of little bits of information from TV, from social media, all these kind of like different facts and different headlines and different things I read, and I kind of like, 
process and assimilate all of those and evaluate them and weigh the evidence and kind of whether I do it consciously or subconsciously, I kind of assimilate all that stuff. That's also like a terrible description of what people do. What people actually do is figure out who I think I can trust and then see what they say. And so, and you know, that's true for all of us. Like, think about any of the things that you think you know about the world. Like the, like the earth revolves around the sun. Most of us, maybe, maybe there's like a earth doesn't revolve around the sun conspiracy theories these days, but like most people think that's true. How do you know that's true? Like how many of you remember, what was the thing Copernicus did like to figure that out, looking at the way the planets moved or something? So, right, if I really pushed you on, give me the evidence. I actually think that that's not true. Um, what's the evidence for it? I certainly don't. I, couldn't tell you. Why do I think it's true? It's because like everybody I know who I trust has always said that's true. Sounded reasonable when they said it, so I believe it. So that is how people reason about the world. And so the, the critical thing is who do people trust? What information sources do people trust? What, what, what do they, um, you know, therefore kind of wait? And so we can show in these kind of echo chambers research, pre-social media, as I said, they're actually not such big echo chambers, and what Democrats are seeing and Republicans are seeing are actually pretty similar for many people, not for everybody, but there's like a lot of people who are seeing very similar content, and somehow, even though they're seeing similar content, they're ending up with like wildly different beliefs and wildly different views. That could be all different dimensions of how they process stuff and emotion and so on, but a big part of it is like, of, they see what, of what they see, what do they trust? What do they wait? I think is a, a really important mechanism for that. Thank you. Uh, there's someone there in the back. My question is, um, how could we prevent polarization in people? What's your opinion? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to give, I, we actually wrote a paper on that and we figured out the answer. I know the answer, I, di I just didn't <laughs> have time to get to that, but I could tell you after. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an incredibly important question. I don't know, I mean, it, it is, particularly in the U.S., so intractable right now. Let, let me say one piece of that puzzle I think is super important in the U.S. right now is, is exactly what we were just talking about, about trust. And so um, here's my pr proposal. The single most effective thing, well, so number one most effective thing to address polarization in the U.S. might have something to do with changes in the way politicians and our leaders are talking about things and doing things. I think that's there's some, there's some stuff, kind of causation flowing from uh, leaders in U.S. political parties on down that's really important. But after that, I think the, the, the single most effective thing to address polarization in the U.S., I would guess, would be let's have a news and information source on the right, which is right-wing, right-leaning, Maybe it's a bit more moderate than Fox News. Maybe it's even just like Fox News, but it actually competes head to head with Fox News. And that would bring more competition and build trust with Republican voters. So the thing that's true in the US, if you look at the media ecosystem in the US, the way things have happened, you have a dozen big, well-funded, important news outlets at the national level, all of which at this point are trusted by Democrats and have like zero, like very low trust among Republicans. And among Republicans, you have one news outlet that they trust, and that's Fox News. And it's the only one. There are others that get talked about, Breitbart, kind of crazy things, like really far to the right, that people on the right also look at. But if you ask them, they themselves say, we don't trust that stuff at all. It's extreme and it's crazy. And so, you know, what, what do you hear if you talk to, if you sort of think about the world from the perspective of a Republican in the U.S.? Like you have the perception, many people have the perception that every 
everybody in all of the rest of the media, all the journalists writing all of these stories, as well as all of the scientists, all of the professors in all of the universities, all of the people who work at all of the tech companies, and a bunch of other people as well, have profoundly different values than I do, look down on me, think that I'm uneducated, think that I'm an idiot, think that I'm bigoted, think that the views that I hold can't possibly be consistent with somebody who's well-meaning or thinking or rational and uh, have an overall view of just incredible condescension toward me. That's kind of what the world looks like, I think, to a lot of people. And the problem is they're right. Like, that's the fundamental thing that's true. And there is, like I said, not one person I know at Stanford who is Trump voter. And we are in a time right now in the US where we are incredibly, we're putting a lot of effort into being incredibly careful about the language we use, about avoiding offending people, about making sure we're not saying anything that might come across as negative toward different groups. What is the one group that you are free to say whatever kind of prejudice stereotyped negative stuff you want about if you work at a US university or a student at a US university is conservatives. So there's no universe in which all of the people on the right, if we just say the right thing or do the right thing or tweak Facebook's algorithm in the right way, are going to start trusting the New York Times. We're going to start trusting that like a bunch of people doing social science research at Stanford are really people they can trust. At this point, you need people on the right who have credibility with them to say, we're going to build trust with these people. We're going to try to provide information. We think that Republicans don't actually want to believe crazy conspiracy theories about the world that are wrong, and so we're going to provide them with actually some accurate information to help differentiate those things. But from a perspective that shares their values, that connects with their background, that is not condescending to them, that doesn't start from the premise that their entire worldview is just some bigoted, bygone, religious, something, 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 basket of deplorables. Thank you. The next question will be here uh, in the front, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for me, our most surprising finding was that deactivating someone's Facebook doesn't have any significant effect on her ability to distinguish between fake and real news. And for me, it's quite counterintuitive. And what do you think is the cause of yeah. this finding? Yeah, good. Thanks for calling that out, because I, I think it's worth clarifying. I, I, that, that finding, I think, looks super surprising, and, and you shouldn't be as surprised by it, or you shouldn't take as much from it as you might be inclined to. So. Let me first be really clear what we did. So what we did is we said, so think about, you know, like ask yourself, how would you do this? You're designing the study, you're making surveys to kind of try to measure these outcomes. What survey questions would you write to try to get at whether Facebook is uh, pushing people toward believing in fake news? It's not, it's, not, it's kind of not obvious because you can't just ask people like, hey, do you believe in fake news? You know, yes or no. Um, so. We wanted to ask people about specific things. Do you think this fact is true or false? Do you think this fact is true or false? Do you think this fact is true or false? So what we did is we looked on over the relevant period what stuff got a lot, of, what were things that fact checkers had determined to be false that got a lot of circulation on social media, on Facebook, and we asked people about those things. Um, and we didn't see a significant effect. But we knew that we wouldn't see a significant effect because we also knew that share of people on Facebook who are exposed to those things, even the 10 most popular misinformation stories on Facebook, is very small. So the effect would have had to have been enormous for us to have power to detect it. Um, and, you know, so, I, so I, think, I think that kind of pushes in two directions. One, the overall scale of that kind of crazy fake news stuff on Facebook has been 
way overstated. Now, big asterisk to that, I should say, is until two things. One, 2020 election aftermath in the US, and two, COVID. So up until 2020, that was way overstated. And all these kind of crazy conspiracies people are talking about, about like the Pope endorsed Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton runs a pedophilia ring in a pizza parlor and like, that stuff was all pretty small share of people were really exposed to them. Um, it has changed a little since 2020 in a pretty scary way. So, so I think what that finding says is, if you pick the 10 biggest things, most people have never heard about them. So that's informative, but it doesn't mean that there couldn't be like, you know, 500 other things and each person has heard one of them. We can't really rule that out. Thank you, Professor. That's all the time we had. Um, now that our just like one more, just like eager, <laughs> eager yeah, question. I, Wait, I can answer. I'll be really, really fast and answer it like super, super fast. I was just eager because I was in the back. But uh, this is about not about media, but about trust and polarization. Do you think uh, monarchies, uh, constitutional monarchies, are less vulnerable to polarization than republics? I just think that the that's presence great, of hmm? what, yeah, that's a great question. I have no idea. I I think. Maybe some, some people here could tell me. My prior, if you just asked me my guess on that before knowing the context of the question, I would have said, my guess is it doesn't matter at all. That like in most countries that are constitutional monarchies, the, the role of the monarch is such that like it's relative, if I think about the UK, places like that, it's a relatively minor part of the overall political discourse. But could, could that be a unifying force? Are there places where it actually is a powerful unifying force? Great question, I have no idea. Um, be super interesting to know. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, now our time is really up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and now that our event is coming to its end, I would like to remind everyone that photo and video recordings have been made of the event. So if you're interested, please make sure to follow the Wright College for Advanced Studies Facebook page if you would like to stay <laughs> updated. Uh, thank you all for attending this very special occasion, the 2021 John von Neumann Award Ceremony and Lecture. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>